Hi, uh, my name is Dan Jacoby, and I'm uh, happy to talk to you today a little bit about genetic testing for inherited cardiovascular disease and sudden death syndrome. Uh, I work at the Yale School of Medicine. I'm an associate professor there and the director of the Advanced Heart Failure and Cardiomyopathy and General Heart Failure Programs. Uh, I do have uh, financial relationships as outlined on this slide. Um, I'd like to start off by just talking about uh, heart disease uh, in general. It's the leading cause of death. Um, in 2013, you can see this pie chart. There is a number of different things, obviously, that uh, cause disease in our society, but heart disease remains the preeminent one. The um, American Heart Association estimates about uh, 800,000 deaths um, per year. That was in 2013, and it's really about a one in three of all deaths. So cardiovascular disease is really a major, major problem. Now, we are entering, as everybody knows, the era of precision medicine. At least we're trying to enter it. Um, and one of the ways that we're doing this is through an explosion of genetic and genomic knowledge. Uh, and this is in part based on the fact that we now have fast and cost-effective sequencing for determination of genetic variants that predispose to disease. And this is really revolutionizing the practice of medicine as we know it. So what are the genetic causes of cardiovascular disease? Well. Uh, this is uh, it's possible to make this very complex, but I think uh, to, to make it sort of straightforward and, and really to cover 90% of the issues, there's monogenetic and polygenetic disorders. The monogenetic disorders or monogenic disorders are ones where there's basically a single gene that drives the clinical picture or the phenotype for that individual. There are clear hereditary features. Um, they're typically, these are typically recognized by the major associations and there are recommended genetic testing for these. And there is autom automatic reporting of incidental findings from exome and genome sequencing. So there's a lot of information out there on the web to help you interpret genetic results. The polygenic diseases are driven by multiple genes. And, you know, a classic for this would be hypertension or essential hypertension, which we know has a big genetic component, but there's not one specific gene that we can say this gene causes hypertension in this group of people. And then there are obviously very strong non-genetic factors for both polygenic and monogenic disorders. Inherited cardiovascular diseases, which is the area in which I practice, are typified by a number of different cardiomyopathies. They're outlined here. The one that uh, is most commonly in the news is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but more than 50% of heart transplants in the country are for dilated cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is something that we think about as being very rare, but in fact, uh, more and more when we pay attention to it, we see that it comes up, and it comes up in familial patterns, often overlapping with hypertrophic. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is more and more recognized as a very common disease that presents mildly in many individuals and just in a few individuals presents in a severe form, and then left ventricular non-compaction, which is obviously gaining traction. So the channelopathies are also included in the uh, inherited cardiovascular diseases, and if you look to the ACCAHA guidelines, you'll see that the classification of disease also includes channelopathies among cardiomyopathies, uh, short QT syndrome, long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome. CPVT, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, where if you've ever seen a case of this, it's absolutely striking with young, healthy people developing polymorphic VT that's life-threatening with uh, activity, soccer playing, moving boxes, so on. And then atrial fibrillation, which is actually an inherited disease in many cases. There are obviously other inherited cardiovascular diseases that we all know about, lipid metabolism, such as familial hypercholesterolemia, vascular disorders, pulmonary hypertension, and HHT, which we have a very large clinic for where I work at Yale, uh, disorders of blood pressure regulation, uh, which we also have a very uh, prominent role in understanding in our genetics program, and then obviously congenital heart malformations. And then there are the aortic and vascular disorders, which uh, you know, are really a sort of spectrum of disorders that cover everything from vascular-specific disease to vascular and muscular disease uh, to ones that affect uh, development, such as Noonan syndrome. And it should be noted that aortic aneurysm is not uh, non-atherosclerotic aortic aneurysm is really not uh, idiopathic at this point. It's really known to be familial in many, many cases. So what are the common features of cardiovascular disease? Well, as in all disease, there's heterogeneity. One thing people forget about is if, you know, 
just because mom has blue eyes doesn't mean kids going to have blue eyes. And the same is true of uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, the disease presents a little bit differently in each person. Um, early diagnosis is actually rather challenging. And unfortunately, sudden cardiac death risk does not always correlate with, detect with easily detectable disease. Uh, so the potential for genetic diagnosis becomes really super important in these cases because the clinical evaluation doesn't always tell you everything about risk. So other benefits of genetic testing, which I've already started to enumerate one, uh, include the very, very important issue of family screening. So when you're telling a patient that they have a disease that may be inherited, the very first thing on their mind is going to be, well, how do I know whether to worry about my kids and how do I keep my family safe? And that's got to be number one on their uh, on your uh, plate in terms of trying to help that patient. And then obviously diagnosis. So um, although this is this is just gaining traction as of late, um, it turns out that a lot of disease that we call idiopathic or viral or otherwise unknown or blame on patients such as hypertension or alcoholic, when you look a little bit closer, you find out that there's strong genetic predisposition running through the family and you reclassify those diseases as familial dilated cardiomyopathy, and we've done some of that work at Yale and found that to be very true. Uh, prognostic evaluation is something that is of great interest and we're continuing to work on in the genetics community, and then obviously there's therapeutic decision making. So what about long QT syndrome? Let's talk a bit about that, uh, risk prevention with long QT syndrome. So obviously there's a number of different types of long QT syndrome. They're associated with different genes, and there's different stimuli that cause uh, that can cause a risk for sudden cardiac death. Uh, obviously, you can do lifestyle counseling. Uh, you can use antiarrhythmic medication, and you can place an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. But making the decision about when to advise each thing is rather complicated. So let's talk about a family history that can help us uh, understand a little bit about how genetic testing can impact with care. Uh, in this case, um, there's a female who's 13 years old, and her mother was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There was sudden death at age 49. The brother had no clinical phenotype of HCM and uh, then had a sudden death at age 19. And the maternal aunt was diagnosed with HCM. And the genetic testing showed a myosin binding protein C mutation. That was a frame shift mutation, meaning that the protein that was encoded from that gene is necessarily going to be shortened and is necessarily going to have some change in function. So what's going to happen to our 13-year-old girl? She's got a mother with this massive ventricle that you can see here depicted, a brother who already died, uh, and a maternal aunt who has the disease. Well, genetic, genetic testing uh, revealed that this mutation was tracking through the family and affected individuals. Uh, and um, they're looking into the database of all this information. You find that there's eight families, 17 carriers, two sudden deaths, and five cardioverter defibrillators for this particular mutation, if you look at all the reported events. And looking at the family tree over here, uh, we see that uh, there are uh, three people affected, um, and the aunt has the positive gene. So what now? We test our child, who's 13, does not carry the family gene. And so what can you say to that person? Well, the person actually uh, now can be followed, can be advised about exercise, and uh, ultimately can have an ICD implanted if they develop any signs of having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's a little bit sad, uh, not really just a little bit, um, that the brother, unfortunately, did not have any risk stratification. And uh, we wish that uh, genetic testing might have shed a little light on this. Here's another case uh, where genetic testing may be useful. It's a 49-year-old woman, acute dissection of type B thoracic abdominal aneurysm at age 36, very young. Uh, she had subclavian aneurysms and actually ended up with an arterial biopsy, which was consistent with Marfan syndrome. Left common iliac aneurysm, and then again an ascending root replacement in 2011, and a right common iliac aneurysm dissection in 2014. Um, so. Uh, I raise a question about diagnosis in this case. It's rather interesting because that's not the typical course for Marfan syndrome. And of course, uh, doing genetic testing, uh, it's possible to discover that a, a TGF beta receptor 1 mutation is present. And this is going to define the patient as having Lois Dietz syndrome. And if you look at the clinical interpretation here, it's actually very helpful. It's, although carriers of this type of mutation can have extra cardiac features that mimic Marfan syndrome, they are at higher risk for aneurysms and dissections. And I think that kind of information is going to be extremely helpful for family members in this case. So what are the results of genetic testing for the family? There's the 49-year-old 
who has positive genetic testing. There's a 19-year-old, unfortunately, who died of dissection, a 20-year-old who's in the military. And then you have a negative uh, sister. So what's going to happen? Well, it turns out that our 20-year-old, who's actually in the military, actually does have the TGF beta receptor 1 gene. And there is a specific medication you can use, angiotensin receptor blocker in this case. But it stands to reason that that person may or may not want to continue with their military career at that point. Uh, they did have a CT scan, and there were some mesenteric aneurysms with mural thrombus, dilated femoral arteries. And uh, obviously, uh, this person is not someone who it would be wise to put under battlefield stress. So uh, they were able to redirect their career and actually have to do something much safer. And uh, that was the effect of genetic testing in this case. So, uh, it, you know, I think the overall important uh, message here is that early and correct diagnosis uh, is actually very helpful in terms of advising your patients, particularly young people who have family histories that are concerning. So let's look at another case of a girl who's eight years old. It was out of hospital cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation, had cardiopulmonary resuscitation, had some hypoxic encephalopathy, and then had a short QT observed uh, on the EKG, ended up obviously with a defibrillator for secondary prevention, and the family history was actually negative. So genetic testing was sent quite appropriately, so I might add, and, and there's some recent literature um, that sheds a little bit more light on the importance of doing genetic testing in um, sudden cardiac death in individuals with uh, no structural heart disease or coronary disease. And uh, they found, uh, the testing found an SLC22A5 mutation, which in this case can lead to a systemic carnitine deficiency. And these systemic carnitine deficiencies can actually be treated with oral therapy, with levocarnitine. And so this is a very important fact. And in fact, I would uh, like to say that uh, one of the things that we do a terrible job of diagnosing in general are these uh, inherited disorders of metabolism. Carnitine is actually an important amino acid for fatty acid metabolism. And a defect in the transporter responsible for moving carnitine across the plasma membrane impairs fatty acid oxidation, leading to a whole bunch of symptoms, but obviously, most importantly, risk for sudden cardiac death. So you can have hepatic presentations, cardiac presentations, and then you can have presentations in adulthood. And all these things can stem. And it's very hard, you can imagine, from so many different features to really put all the pieces together, whereas genetic testing really gives you the idea up front. So in this case, clear diagnosis was able to lead to optimal treatment. Um, the uh, uh, clinical report included a systemic review about the gene and related disease. And, um, I actually find that that's a very helpful feature in that, you know, you may be faced with having uh, this finding in a patient where you're not exactly sure where to turn to next, and having that embedded in the report is actually very useful. And it also offers information about treatment options and monitoring for the disease. And I'll just add a little note here that I found that when there's any question about it, uh, contacting the genetics team for further information uh, has been very easy and has actually led to an ability to even interpret the gene further and understand how that may impact the rest. In summary, I think uh, everyone will agree that family screening is one of the most important aspects of getting a genetic diagnosis, but disease diagnosis and reducing the number of idiopathic cases that we have in our clinics is important. We need to provide appropriate genetic counseling, and in order to do so, we need to know what the gene mutation is that we're looking at, what the basis is for that. We need to improve our prognostic evaluation, and genetic testing helps us do that, and it also helps us with therapeutic decision-making. Thank you for your time and attention, and I wish you all the best.